I'm Captain George Vasilakis, Commanding Officer USS Baton. Uh, the crew here was recently involved in the rescue of over 275 migrants here in the Sixth Fleet area of a responsibility. Uh, the following is an account from the folks that were involved firsthand in the rescue this past weekend. The day it was not an ordinary day. About four o'clock we got the call that there was gonna be about 40 migrant folks that were floating, you know, just off the I think the starboard side of the baton, and that they were sending a starboard out and that they were gonna be looking into if any of them were injured or needed to come aboard. Initially it was it was so fast, nobody really knew what was going on at the time. Deck department as a whole, we just reacted and went into uh went into our normal operation mode. At the time, we were told that uh, there was say, uh, uh, personnel already in the water and that there were additional, uh, additional personnel and the, the boat was sinking. My guys are all well trained. They did exactly what they were told, everybody top to bottom. Line handlers on the davit to line handlers in the well deck, line handlers in the PL, the davit captains, everybody, boat coxswains. Everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do and exactly what they were trained to do. As soon as we got there, we started uh, started letting the star swimmer get out the boat. BM2 Ezra there was a swimmer at that time. Well, we arrived on scene and I analyzed the situation, looked to see what was going on and saw that the uh, HSC-22 crew member was already in the water aiding the uh, sinking raft victims. Initially, I inflated my LPU-28, my flotation, handed it off to the first survivor and I just started taking them out one at a time, loading them into our boat. Before I knew it though, the uh, the rib was full. Couldn't put any more people. I loaded up 14 survivors already and then the PL came around with, uh, which was carrying the second rescue swimmer, BM-2 Stedham. He, uh, he also arrived on scene, deployed immediately and I we, we briefed real quick as to what was going on and worked together as a team uh, to start pulling people out of the water. We, we calculated about a solid hour to an hour and a half, just nonstop swimming. Well, all I can remember is just making continuous trips back and forth and back and forth. Uh, what I did was I contacted my MAs and told them, uh, I gave them a briefing of uh, what I knew what was happening. Uh, we armed up, uh, which is standard protocol, and I divided my team up. I had uh, my flight deck triage team, and then I had my well deck because I was told that they would bring, be bringing uh, personnel uh, alongside. Finally, we, we got our word to pull them all into the well deck and unload them. We, we all had kind of guessed that at one point or another we'd be going back out to get the other two boats that were around um, from the first sinking boat. We, we could see them sitting off to the side and we knew they would linger around. Uh, we, we had the initial 75. Again, we thought that, okay, we're going to, you know, things are calming down, we're going to bed them down. That's when we found out that we were getting an additional 200, uh, 200 uh, personnel. When they called away the second boat, we were getting cleaned up, cleaning up our gear. We always take it into the head, into the shower to rinse off fresh water, wind, rinse our gear. And um, all of a sudden, the boat coxswain, my boat coxswain for the rib, came in and said, hey, we're going out to get the other two. And we immediately, you know, got dressed out, ran out to the rib davit, and waited for us to uh, to deploy the boat again to lower the boat to the water. And we got in. Myself and BM2 were on this one. Went out and searched for the two other zodiacs that were still out there. We signaled them over with uh, chem lights and told them to follow the boat. And we gave them instructions as to what to do, and pulled the first craft right up onto the stern gate into the well, and dis disembark the crew. For the second, I want to say we were out for maybe five-ish hours. Mixed emotion for everybody, just relieved, nervous. I'm sure they had to be wondering what was going to happen to them next. And just the excitement of them being able to step onto our ship and out of their small craft into the well deck, there was definitely a sense of excitement. We kept telling, having to tell them to slow down, take your time. We don't want anybody to, to get hurt, obviously and they just couldn't wait to get out and into our ship, it seemed like. Our responsibility is to make sure that they, uh, they remain calm, they remain contained, um, and that we would escort them as needed to wherever they needed to be. We figured out that, hey, we'll line them up kind of like an assembly line, we'll get them through the initial screening process. My MAs between doing security screenings and helping with uh, 
uh, the stretcher bearers. Uh, they were pretty much getting involved in every aspect. Once they were through us, that was when we would ensure that they got a something to eat, uh, some water. Most of them were pretty di dehydrated. We determined that we would have a security area once they were uh, uh, determined safe and everything. We would put them in a security area. The medical would come in and do their evaluation. We started going to work setting up medical because um, we have different layers of medical care down there so just to like make it kind of make sense we have like a whole trauma setup so we set up five trauma bays ready to receive like critically injured patients we set up three ORs and then moved to setting up all 15 ICU beds and then 40 ward beds ready to receive. During any kind of medical uh, emergency uh, mass casualty um, my job is to man the ICU and wait for patients to uh, to come to me. So we have our whole medical department is integrated. So we have blue corpsmen, we have green corpsmen who work with 22nd Mew, and then we have actually two fleet surgical teams on board. So we kind of dispersed everybody out. We were all just kind of, we went into mode like uh, we've trained a lot for this. And so we just kind of are working back and forth, trying to get patients debrided, get them comfortable, um, make sure that they've got fluids, water, food. We had a few people coming up trying to ask, ascertain where the uh, people were from, what languages they spoke. Um, we tried speaking some French. Um, some people knew a little bit of Arabic. We saw a gentleman from Nigeria who had told us that he had actually gotten on a truck, had been on a truck packed with about 60 other people and had ridden for like two days up to catch a boat and the boat was gonna take him to Italy. The first sinking boat had one, one young man who was in, in pretty bad condition. They brought in a patient um, who we never found out what his name was or where he was from. None of the other people that we talked to seemed to know who he was and he was not doing well at all. Our senior chief uh, said, Ramaki, you need it in the uh, ER. He had barely palpable pulses down in the well deck. Uh, we couldn't get IV access on him because he was so dehydrated. Um, he was not responding to any verbal cues. Realized that the patient was r like soaking wet and he was shivering, he was very cold, so uh, we stripped all his clothing off um, and we got an internal temperature um, of 88 degrees, which is hypothermic, which is bad news. That's really, really low. Once we identified him, other patients started, you know, kind of like letting us know like hey I've got burns, I've got burns here, I've got burns there and then we started seeing the magnitude that people were actually injured. We started ushering people in and um, noticing that the first 40 that we brought in had pretty significant burns. Um, I found out later that they were their boat had caught fire and they were actually sitting in like diesel and then the diesel mixed with the salt water had kind of caused their skin to peel away. In the States, if you have a second degree burn, you're going to spend whatever that percentage of burn is plus 30 days in a burn center. And we had people with 20, 30 percent burns, 40 percent burns on their bodies that had had those for several hours. Our corpsmen actually went to work instantly and they all kind of assumed care of different patients. And they started the debridement, which is actually a very painful process. They did the dressings, they applied like all the special, we have silvidine cream on the ship, they applied the silvidine, IV access, and then we had the one critical patient, um, the John Doe, who all night was kind of touch and go. Uh, like about 2 a.m. he started doing really poorly. He was in and out of consciousness. Uh, he had burns about, um, about 18 to 20 percent of, uh, of his legs. And Almost all the corpsmen in the ICU and I are all like, kind of like looking at ourselves like what's going to happen if this gentleman doesn't make it because he was so significantly burned, he was hypothermic. He ended up being a true uh, intensive care unit patient. Uh, we had to intubate him. Um, we had to get an arterial line, a central line through his neck. Um, so he was in really rough shape. And then about 3 a.m. he started like turning a corner and that was like the most awesome feeling. His core temperature was 88 when we first got him. Um, by the time we medevaced him out at 5 in the morning, it was right up at 95, right back getting close to normal, so he was stabilizing. Um, and as far as I know from the medevac, Lieutenant Commander Shrek uh, told us that he had made it uh, in the same state that he left, which is always our goal. Had we not picked him up, he was hours away from death, for sure. Like, he definitely would not have made it. And then when he left here, he was actually doing phenomenally. Once they were done with their medical screening, then 
uh, our main focus then is what we were going to do with them afterwards. On Saturday morning around 6, they told us to man the boat decks. We were going to uh, transport the migrants over to the Maltese ship, lowered the stern gate, and started embarking personnel onto the boats. That took a couple hours. Once they embarked the Maltese ship, it was a uh, smooth sailing after that. So it was very humbling to see the lengths that folks will go for more opportunity. I mean, to put yourself on a life raft and just out in the ocean, I'm going to take my chances in shark infested water with the sun for however many days in a Zodiac boat that's not built for that number of people because wherever you're leaving is so bad that you feel like that's your best option. Something like this, uh, this was the first time I'd ever had anything uh, like this. And it, it was definitely a, it, it brings to home on, on just how lucky we as Americans are. Just thinking about the whole situation, the real life situation that was going on and how lucky we actually are as Americans and the things that we take for granted every day.